So we are on day five of our Digital Engagement 201 course. And today we are focusing all on assessing impact, reach, and engagement of digital content. So for those who might be joining us for the first time, um, I think I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those who are joining us for the first time, I am Danae Wolf, the Educational Technology Specialist with our Learning and Org Development Unit with Ohio State University Extension. And like I said, we're gonna be jumping in talking about impact, reach, and engagement of different digital content methods and content types. So let's go ahead and jump right into the formal presentation. I thought we would start by going over some basic terminology because there's a lot of different words and phrases that we use to talk about in some cases what is the same thing and in other cases it's not the same thing at all. So let's start first with talking about what is impact. And when we talk about evaluation and we talked about uh, impact reporting, what we're really referring to is a change in awareness, which oftentimes is a short-term impact. That can happen um, at, in something as simple as somebody attending a program or even somebody scrolling through social media and coming across something like a video or an infographic that you create. If done well, that piece of content can change somebody's entire awareness of a situation. Maybe they've learned something that they just never knew before. Um, next, we have a change in behavior. So this would be somebody taking an actionable step as a result of either attending a program or following you on social media or as a result of your programming. And then finally, what we want to achieve is a change in condition, which is a little, a little bit more long term impact. It's something that usually happens over a period of time. Um, and this is a little bit more difficult to measure because we're really talking about something that's measured over a period of time, as opposed to something that's measured like immediately following a single event. Now, when we talk about digital content in particular, because so much digital content is um, it's not evergreen, meaning it doesn't stay relevant for a long period of time, although some things can. Um, a lot of times digital content comes and goes very, very quickly. So it's a little bit difficult to measure like a change in condition as a result of somebody like following your Facebook page or as a result of somebody like watching a YouTube video that you created. So really when it comes to platforms like social media, what we're talking about is really indirect and informal contacts. And we're, we're measuring more things like reach and engagement and not so much impact. Now there are ways that you can measure some of those change in behaviors and maybe even change in condition with social media, but it's gonna be a little bit more strategy involved with measuring things like that. So I've organized this presentation to kind of talk about the informal or indirect contacts and platforms that we can use. And then we'll talk briefly about some of the more formal content like webinars and online courses that you can use. So let's jump right in. We're gonna talk um, quite a bit about Facebook pages because I know many of you are using Facebook pages and that's content that you as an administrator can actually dig into and look at your insights um, and see what your numbers look like on your Facebook pages. So let's first talk a little bit about reach. So your reach on Facebook means the number of people who could have, not the number of people who did for sure, but the number of people who could have seen your content. In other words, this means that Facebook fed that content to somebody's newsfeed and they had the possibility of scrolling by it in their newsfeed. It's not a, an absolute number. So if you have, um, I just looked at my Facebook reach for the last 28 days this morning and it was like 150,000 people reached from all of my posts over the last 28 days. That doesn't mean that 150,000 people actually saw it. It just means that Facebook fed that content to 150,000 people and they could have seen it. Reach is a really good number to look at though because it kind of lets you know just how far and wide your posts have gone. Um, and this usually happens uh, through, through your direct page followers, but it also happens through shares. So if somebody shares like a post that you make or a video that you um, post to Facebook, then all of their followers now have the potential of also seeing that content. So next we have engagements and Facebook in particular measures engagement through reactions. So that would be the like, the love, the sad, the angry. There's a fifth one, what am I missing? Like, love, sad, angry, oh, the wow, <laughs> or the surprise face. Um, those are the reactions that you can give to a post on Facebook. We also have comments. So reactions are nice because it means that people engaged with it kind of minimally. Um, comments are even nicer because it means that people took the time to comment on the post. They probably absorbed it a little bit more. 
Um, if they really liked it, they could have shared it with their followers. And finally, we have post clicks. Now, post clicks would be something like if you posted a photo or if you posted a link, somebody could click that photo to enlarge it and see it in full screen. They could have clicked a video to enlarge it and see it in full screen, or they could have clicked a link that took them to a third party platform um, hosted like on a different website. Facebook doesn't always play nicely with third party links, especially if you're linking to something like YouTube because YouTube and Facebook are direct competitors. So um, it's interesting because if I post like a news article on my page, some of those news articles are some of the most engaged with posts on my page. Um, but if I post something like a link to a Zoom meeting or a link to a YouTube, Facebook really doesn't like that. So you do kind of have to play around to see what works well. Um, just a, a tip that we've talked about over the last two months when, when we talk about video content in particular, if you are going to upload a video uh, to Facebook, don't share it from YouTube. Upload that content natively to Facebook's platform and it's going to go a lot further and Facebook's going to push that to a lot more people. So what are some of the ways that you can measure if you're trying to measure true impact on Facebook? Some people might think immediately, well, I can create something like a Qualtrics survey, and then I can post that Qualtrics survey on my Facebook page. All of my followers are going to see it. They're going to click the link. It's going to take them to this survey. And then you could ask questions like, hey, as a result of following this Facebook page, have you learned anything new? Or do you intend to or have you changed a behavior? So you can get some impact data, like true impact data beyond just reach and engagement, but the chances of somebody taking a formal evaluation from your Facebook page is probably somewhat minimal. That said, you could always give it a try and see what that looks like. A better route to go though would be to use Facebook polls and use them sparingly. You don't wanna like launch a poll every single day, but polls would work really well if, for example, you want to spend an entire week doing something like a social media campaign where every day of the week you are going to post a piece of content around the same topic. It might be something like pesticide safety. It might be something like getting your kids to eat more fruits and vegetables. So one day you post an infographic, the next day you post a video, the next day you post like a photo, the next day you post another video. And then at the end of that week, you could launch a Facebook poll, which is all natively housed within the Facebook platform, asking people questions like, you know, did you, like, do you intend to change your behavior? Or as a result of seeing this content, did you feed your children more fruits and vegetables? Or did they eat more fruits and vegetables? You can get some really good data here. Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to go to my Facebook page and I am going to show you how to launch a Facebook poll because it's not as intuitive as it used to be. If you're on your Facebook page, you used to be able to just write a post here and you have these options that pop up and you should all be seeing my, my Facebook screen, right? <laughs> Before I go any further. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So you used to have the option of just clicking a poll right here. Facebook is trying to move page management to Creator Studio. So you'll have the option, and again, depending on what version of Facebook you're on, sometimes Facebook pushes updates and changes to some accounts and they don't push it to everybody. So they kind of like do a beta with some people, but not everybody. So your interface might look a little bit different than mine, but you would just click Creator Studio and it's gonna open up a whole new page for you. And from here, if you go to the upper left-hand corner of the page, you can click Create Post, you can upload a video, you can go live, in this case, we're just gonna click create post. It's gonna pop open a new window here on the right-hand side. And from here, I have the option to create a poll. So it asks me, what do you wanna ask? So I could type in something like, did you feed your children more fruits and vegetables? Or did your children eat more fruits and vegetables? And you could do like a simple yes, no. Um, you could get way more involved with how you, how you ask these questions and what questions you ask. I believe you can only do one question at a time. So it's not like you can sit here and have like 10 questions in a single poll. It's just a one question poll. But you can get some good, some good feedback here from your participants. Again, that works really well if you have like a dedicated campaign. If you just decide one day, hey, I'm gonna see how people like my Facebook page and I'm gonna ask something like, hey, do you like what you're seeing? You could do something like that. But people responding yes to that probably isn't giving you a lot of impact data, right? It just means that they like your page and they like the content. 
Um, I've seen a lot of my friends post pages or post uh, poll questions that are things like, what do you want to see more of? You know, what are we doing really well? Or, you know, what could we improve on? And that gives them some good just general feedback to maybe change things up a little bit on Facebook. So any questions about Facebook polls before we go further? Because I am going to show you how to pull your insights out of Facebook as well and get some more of that robust, like your reach and engagement and all of that stuff. But anytime you have questions, feel free to just post those into the chat um, and I'll keep responding to those as I see them come in. So the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is Facebook groups. Um, because fa Facebook groups are a really, really wonderful way to build relationships with clients in a way that you might not be able to do through a public facing uh, Facebook page. You know, a, a page is really all about one way communication. So yes, people can comment on your post. People, if you've turned that feature on, people can even uh, post content to your page. And then it goes to kind of a hidden area called visitor post, which most people don't ever see or look at. Um, you may or may not even get a notification when somebody posts to your page. I think most people probably shut that feature off because they don't want to have to manage it. Um, it's a little bit harder to, to build really robust, strong relationships with people on a page. It's doable though, um, but in a Facebook group, it allows for two-way communication, not just two-way communication, but really multi-way communication because anybody can post something in a group. So you can create really, really robust conversation that you as the page administrator or group administrator rather might not even be a part of that conversation, but you're facilitating a, a platform for other people to have really great conversation. So I have heard of situations where people are managing a Facebook group and because they've built strong relationships with group members, they can post something like a formal evaluation that, that asks questions that really dig into the impact. Like, how has this group helped support you? And then people can start to respond with things like, this group has completely changed my perspective on this topic. Or because of my, um, I'm in a native plant group, for example, I don't ad administer it, but somebody else does. But I routinely see people post in that group that, because of my membership in this group, I am planting more native plants in my landscape. I have a better understanding of the ecosystem services of my landscape than I've ever had before in my life. People are actually giving true impact data in that group. Um, and you, you can absolutely, you can absolutely start to get some of that impact data, but it's all about relationship building. So you really do have to start building those relationships before you just like dive into evaluating what the impact is. So T just said, I just ran a comprehensive survey a, on a Facebook group page. Yeah, so you absolutely can, can do that. Again, it's all about relationship building. If you don't have good relationships with the people in your group or on your page, there's probably a good chance that you're not gonna get a lot of impact data, but you can still get a lot of um, really robust data um, on things like your reach and engagement. So before I go any further. I'm yeah, I just was gonna say, Danae, that's so true what you just said. The reason we've been successful with it is because of the relationships. And T, I, I wanted to give you a chance. Do you wanna say anything more about that? Well, it's a, it's a research project that I had uh, uh, carried on from Maryland with a couple of colleagues. And it uh, is a group of people that's very hard to reach in just in the, in the population but there is a closed Facebook page of this particular population. And the principal, the principal, the PI, is a member of that group. And we decided we were gonna try it. There was nothing to tell me that that would be successful. Um, and we, we decided to go for it. And actually, it's worked out really well. We're, we're actually gonna try to do a Tools of the Trade article. Uh, Danae is gonna work with us on that about our experience of how we made it work. But let me just say reposting is key. Yeah, so you mean reposting, if you link to an evaluation, making sure that, because as a group like functions, like if you post a link to an evaluation and then it kind of gets lost in the group because other people are posting, um, making sure that you're reposting it and then reaching out to the, the people that you have relationships with in the group too, to say, hey, we have this evaluation. We'd love if you could complete it. Exactly. And we'd love if you could encourage other people to complete it as well. Um, it's all about relationships. <laughs> all about it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, T, for that. It's always good to like see tangible examples of where like true evaluation has been accomplished with digital content, particularly these less formal types of digital content. 
So let's dive a little bit into Facebook insights. I'm going to spend more time on Facebook because more people are using Facebook than other platforms like YouTube and Twitter and Instagram. Um, I will say a few words about YouTube and, and Twitter. If you want to dive into analytics on things like Instagram, I can curate some resources for you there. I'm not an Instagram user myself. I have an account and I rarely, rarely use it. So I didn't want to speak out of turn and talk about something that I just don't have a lot of experience with. Um, most of my social media presence lives on Facebook, almost exclusively on Facebook, in fact. So I'm here on my page. I'm going to go to this button that says insights along my top menu. And it's going to pull up right here. It's a page summary of all of my insights. And for now, it, it says over the last seven days. So I usually like to change this to the last 28 days. It kind of gives me a more month, like month focused view on um, all of my different engagement. The thing that I want to draw your attention to, because there is a whole host of data and statistics available in your page insights. I wanted to draw your attention to your page views. That's how many people have viewed your page. Uh, your post reach, which again, going back to reach, that's the total number of people. And if you hover over the little I for information, the number of people who saw any of your posts at least once. Um, and it says this metric is estimated. So this does say it's people who actually saw your post, but that could have just been like they very quickly scrolled by it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they engaged with it in any meaningful way. The one right underneath that is your post engagement. So this is people who engage with the post through reactions, comments, shares, and clicks. And that's the more meaningful number. Now you can, um, you can calculate this out and get an engagement rate. So I know I have 150,000 people who have potentially seen my post and 30,000 people actually engaged with the post. So that gives me an engagement rate of what, like 20%? Um, which is pretty high because industry standards are much, much lower than that. You can actually look at different industry standards for Facebook engagement. And I want to say it's like 0.8% is like the average um, engagement rate for, I think that was higher, edu higher education industry. But there are some statistics that you can find that show like what the standard engagement rates are across different industries. The other things that you want to be mindful of, and these are some of the things that you might want to report at the end of the year. Um, we will have a discussion at the end of today's session. Debbie Lewis is going to give us a, a bit of a discussion about where you can report these numbers in Vita for those of you who report in Vita. So that will be helpful. Um, I also want to point out the page likes and the page followers. On one of our previous sessions, um, I remember talking about the difference between page likes and page follows. Followers are more, like your number of followers is a more impactful number than your likes because people can choose to like your page and then unfollow it, in which case they appear as a like, but they're not actually seeing any of your page's content appear in their newsfeed. And that could be because maybe they got really annoyed with a post, maybe they you know, thought that you were posting too much, they just wanted to take a break, whatever. So they unfollowed your page. In some cases, this could be people who really wanna support you as a page like, but they really have no interest um, in your page, this is like the like your mom and dad or like grandma and grandpa who are like, we support you, we like your page, but we don't care about it. So we're not going to actually follow it. We're not going to see any of the content um, show up. So it's like the mom and pop likes is what I sometimes like to call that. Um, the, the, those are kind of like ghosts. They're people who like your page, but they don't follow it. So they're not probably engaging with your post. So the followers is a more impactful number than your page likes. Uh, if you scroll down, um, again, I've showed this before in one of our previous sessions, you can click your more post and you can get kind of an assessment here of how well your posts are doing. So you can see like picture posts do okay. This video post, I posted a short film that I made. This one did really, really well. This was most of my post engagement or reach for the last 28 days came down to this single video that I published. It's a really good sort of snapshot assessment of how your page is doing. Um, under this post, uh, post tab as well. Um, and this is just sort of an aside, not really about reach or engagement. It gives you an idea of when your audience is spending time online by day of the week and by time of the day. So this can give you kind of a snapshot of when the best time to post content on Facebook is. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you, if you go back to your overview tab on the left hand side, you can actually export all of your engagement data, all of your reach data. And if you quote, um, I'm just going to click this. You can export up to 500 posts at a time. And I think for date range, you can only go back like 180 days maybe. 
So this will give you either an Excel file or a CSV file. It'll spit out for you. It takes a few minutes to actually populate and then download on your computer. This will give you way more information than you've ever wanted to know. Um, you can choose to export just your page data, or you can go to post data, in which case it's going to drop down a list of every single post you've made and then all of the engagement metrics. And again, there is way more information here than you ever need to know. My biggest recommendation is, especially for those of you who are reporting in Vita at the end of the year, and that's our reporting platform for educators and other positions who have to, like our faculty and stuff. Um, I recommend if you're using multiple engagement platforms like social media platforms, create an Excel document for yourself and just label it. Like at the top, you can have your different platforms that you're using and then every single month go in and you know pull those stats, like pull the, your basic stats, like your page likes. So at the end of the year, you can go in and see, well, my Facebook page growth was 50% or maybe I grew it 100% over the last 12 months. That's really good information to have and that's going to be really impactful information for you to report at the end of the year. Um, and again, Debbie will tell us more about how to, how to go about reporting statistics like that. So any questions about um, kind of digging into your, your Facebook insights? I don't have time to really dig deep into reach and engagement here, but I just kind of wanted to mention um, Facebook because I know many of you are using, are using Facebook. So as you're thinking about those questions and maybe typing them into the chat, um, some really simple ways that you can think about increasing your Facebook engagement would be things like if you're posting video content, as I mentioned, make sure that you're uploading that natively to the Facebook platform. Don't host it on another platform like Vimeo or YouTube and then try to post the link to that because Facebook just doesn't play nicely. You'll want to post at least, at least three times a week. On my personal page, I try to post more like at least three times a day. I haven't been so great with that lately. And I know that seems like a lot and it can be, um, but do try to post like three to five times a week at least so that you're keeping um, top of mind for your audience. It's okay to curate some of your content. In fact, it's okay to curate a majority of the content that you post. A lot of the content that I post on my page is not content that I myself created. It's stuff that I found interesting elsewhere, usually because of, of the pages that I follow and the people that I follow. They post a lot of really great like bug content or native plant content, and I just can grab that and share it to my page, and that's okay. Just make sure that you're sharing credible information that would be in line with what we as an extension organization would be sharing with our audiences. And again, you want to make sure that you're posting highly shareable content. So photos, graphics, infographics, funny things, memes that are appropriate, uh, video content. These are all things that people really enjoy sharing with their followers. Um, and that's just some good, some good tips and tricks. Now, how many Twitter users do we have on the call today? You can just go ahead and type into the chat or you can give me a thumbs up in the participants panel. A lot of people don't use Twitter. Twitter is actually one of the least used social media platforms out there. Um, I see Peggy said no, Alexis uses it using Twitter a little. Yeah, so that's kind of what I suspected. So I didn't want to spend a ton of time talking about Twitter. Um, I use Twitter primarily um, as like a personal learning network for myself. So if I, usually if I'm just feeling like incredibly bored, which is rare, I'll go onto Twitter and just kind of peruse through. But Twitter is not my favorite platform. Uh, Twitter analytics will give you like the number of people who follow you, which is again, like your, your Facebook followers. That's a good number to report at the end of the year. You can get impressions, which is the number of times people saw your tweets. You can get the number of profile visits. You can also get your number of mentions. So this is the number of times people tweeted and mentioned you in a tweet. Your followers is probably going to be one of the, um, the best numbers to pool um, and then post that like in your Vita report just to kind of see you know, how many followers you have. Impressions is kind of good too because that's the equivalent of Facebook reach. It's the number of times people saw your tweet. So it's kind of a good idea to pull impressions. When I just scrolled through my Twitter analytics this morning, it basically gave me an overview month by month. So I could scroll back through time and see month by month. So again, it's a good idea if you just want to keep up to date with that, just to go into your Twitter account once a month and maybe you just save like a half hour or an hour for yourself once a month where you go into Facebook and Twitter and your other social platforms and just pull these numbers, put them in an Excel file and just keep them updated so you can easily report them at the end of the year. 
So similarly, I know many of you probably aren't using a YouTube channel, but some of you might be posting video content to the Extension Professionals YouTube channel. Um, Mitch Mosier does manage that account, and that is an account for any like county created uh, Facebook, or I'm sorry, video content. That's a hosting platform. One of the biggest questions I've gotten over the last couple of weeks, I think since our video production bootcamp, was how do I actually distribute video content? A lot of people want to post video content to their county Facebook, or I'm sorry, their county website. You cannot host a video natively on your county website. It's not a video hosting platform. So you do have to host that on a platform like YouTube. And then once it's uploaded to the YouTube account, you will get a link or an embed code that you can then post on your website. Anybody should be able to go to that video and see exactly how many views that video content has. If you're interested in getting more robust analytics like the watch time, so this is like the number of minutes or hours people actually spend watching your content. And for our LOD folks, our number has like skyrocketed on our LOD YouTube channel over the last couple of months because we've been posting so much um, content on YouTube. So that's kind of a neat thing to see. You can also see your number of subscribers. Again, this is the number of subscribers to the YouTube channel as a whole. And since a lot of you probably aren't managing your, like your own YouTube account, um, I didn't want to spend a tremendous amount of time here. But if you're interested, I would say reach out to Mitch Mosier and, and see if you can get some of those stats on any of the video content that you've, that you've um, posted. Otherwise, it's probably just a good idea to go to your public facing videos wherever they're hosted and pull the number of views. And you can see like across all of your videos that are posted, maybe you got, you know, 5,000 views over the course of a year. And that's like 5,000 people who have watched your content, which is kind of great. I did want to talk a little bit about e-newsletter reports. I know a lot of you are using MailChimp, um, which is a platform that I have taught many people how to use over the last couple of years. MailChimp is actually no longer an approved e-newsletter platform for the university. And I have asked if we have any free alternatives. I cannot find any free alternatives that are approved. Um, it, I, if you have questions on like whether you should continue using MailChimp or not, unfortunately, I can't answer that question off the top of my head. Um, all I know is that OCIO has come out and said any current use of MailChimp is considered unapproved. Um, there are other platforms though that you can pay for like Constant Contact. If you're doing an, an e-newsletter, some of the good things to report would be the number of subscribers to your newsletter. So this would be the number of people on your listserv. You can also dig into the number of opens. So typically you get like an open rate. So if you know you have 500 people on your, your listserv and you get 400 people that routinely open, uh, your open rate is going to be 80%, which is actually astoundingly high for a mass email listserv. You can also see the total number of clicks. So if you have hyperlinks in your e-newsletter, you can see where people clicked, um, what content they engaged with. And then you can also um, look at the number of emails that you sent over a period of, of like a year, for example. So when it comes to reporting this at the end of the year, you might say, I sent one email per month for the year. So I sent 12 emails. We had an open rate of 80% and we had 500 people on our list. Those would be really good numbers to report. Now I do see a question. I've created a Facebook page to engage students from my community. Mm, that's a really interesting question. Um, you might want to follow up with, uh, maybe follow up with one of our LOD members to kind of think about maybe strategy for that in particular, because that's a pretty, um, pretty specific use of, of Facebook. And I'll have to think about that, like how to strategize around getting increased engagement uh, with different languages spoken. Yeah, let's, uh, let's follow up with that question. Feel free to send me an email and we can chat. So Alexis asks, is there any way to track some of these things for free in Outlook? Uh, that's a great question. And somebody might know more than I. I don't know of any way to track like open rates. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I started moving people away from using like our, our OSU listserv, which I can't remember, Mailman is what it's called, I think, is the listserv platform that like you, anybody can just go in and like create a, an OSU managed listserv. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you don't get stats like that. You don't get open rates. Um, you can do basic stuff, like you can look at your number of subscribers, 
but you can't really go in and dig into a lot of those analytics. That's why I spent um, a lot of time moving people into MailChimp because it gave you the analytics, which is really, really wonderful. I don't know of any way to track analytics in Outlook. Um, I can do some digging though, um, and we can have a follow-up conversation about that. But yeah, off the top of my head, I don't think there's any easy way to do that. So I also wanted to talk about the idea of doing like a social media campaign. I kind of alluded to this when we talked about uh, Facebook and maybe having like a week where you post dedicated content about a particular topic. You can, you can start to curate some content if you use a unique hashtag. So in particular, if you're trying to start like a big sort of statewide movement or something, um, you can create a unique hashtag and then invite people to use that hashtag. And especially on Facebook, anything that's published with public um, privacy. So in most situations, we tend to recommend that like your Facebook privacy, your posts are set to only your friends can see it. So typically like only your friends can see it and maybe your friends of friends. You can also set that to global, which means that that post is completely public and anybody can access it. If you are going to do like a hashtag campaign and you want people to contribute, only things that, only posts that are made public will you be able to curate. And it's kind of nice, Facebook, Facebook doesn't run on hashtags in the same way that Twitter and Instagram do, um, only because of a lot of those privacy settings. But you can still, you can still run a really successful social media campaign using hashtags on Facebook. You just kind of have to make sure you're communicating with people who are posting so that they know that they have to make their post public. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention here, and this is where the strategy in digital content really starts to come into play. When we start to go back to um, what impact is, right? You can measure like awareness, you can measure a behavioral change, you can measure uh, your, your conditional change in a situation. We also start to think about our extension web of engagement or path of engagement, depending on what you prefer to call that. It's a really good idea to understand, and I think I have a few slides later on, but I'll mention it here too. It's a really good idea to understand why you are developing digital content. And that will help you create your evaluation metrics early on. So if you know that you're gonna do a webinar, think to yourself, what is it that I need to be measuring here? Am I doing this webinar to change somebody's awareness about a particular topic? Am I going to equip them with the information they need to change their behavior? Um, and then is this webinar a part of a bigger package or a bigger portfolio of products and events that can then maybe we can really start to think about measuring change of condition over time, right? Maybe that webinar is like one piece of a much larger portfolio. And in extension, that's, that tends to be what we want to get to, right? Is we have a big portfolio of products around, let's say, pesticide safety or water quality. Within that big, what we typically call a big P program, we have the small P programs, which are our individual events. And then we'll also have a suite of products like infographics and videos. And all of that collectively can be measured over time to start to think about that long-term conditional change or long-term impact. If you are doing something like a social media campaign, your entire objective might be just to increase awareness around a particular topic. In which case, when you think about the evaluation for that, you're going to be asking people questions about how their awareness of the situation changed. You might not be measuring conditional change. You might not be measuring behavioral change. So those are just some things to think about. You really have to strategize around evaluation, um, regardless of whether it's digital content or not. Um, but with digital content, you just really have to be aware of what it is that you're trying to achieve and then how are you going to measure that. So I did see Jared mention in the chat, looks like you can incorporate Google Analytics um, into Outlook emails. We'd have to contact um, maybe some folks with OCIO to determine if that's a route that we can go. I know we're not supposed to be using any Google Suite products um, because nothing is approved for use through the third party um, security assessment, but maybe we can reach out to OCIO and figure out like what is a, a good way to measure the reach and engagement of like an Outlook listserv, for example, um, because that would be really helpful information to have. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention here is um, it's a good idea to try and track what people are saying on social media in particular. 
So if you manage a really engaging Facebook page or Facebook group and you start to get comments from people, things like, oh my gosh, you know, I've been following this page for a year and my awareness of this topic has changed so much. Those are really good comments to collect. This is qualitative data that you can just start to keep. Like even if you just, sometimes what I do is like just screenshot a lot of that information. So I just have like a little folder that I keep on my desktop. But anytime I see a comment like that come through, I just screenshot it. You could also like copy and paste some of those comments into an Excel file. Um, and it's really good just to have some of that anecdotal evidence or anecdotal information of how people are changing their awareness or changing their behavior. Um, so keep in mind, like keep an eye on your comment sections on your social media accounts in particular, so you can ensure that you're actually collecting some of that information. So we could have talked about some other types of platforms. We could have talked about things like podcasts and a number of other different tools or technologies, but we're just sort of scratching the surface here, talking about how to think about evaluation for informal content. I wanna just talk for a moment about some of the ways that we can evaluate like direct or formal contacts. This is probably more in line with what most people are accustomed to doing because it's very similar to what we do for face-to-face -face programs because it's a little bit easier because we know who our audiences are. On social media, like yeah, you may have a list of everybody that follows you, but chances are you don't have their contact information. It's like you have their email address that you can just email, unless of course they're subscribed to your email, in which case you probably do have their email. Um, but it's a little bit easier to, to measure things like impact, awareness, you know, your behavioral change on something that's a little bit more formal where you have like a live audience and you can actually capture people's information and you can send them a follow-up evaluation after your event. So this would be like a Zoom webinar or an online course where people are registering. And this is why if you're doing anything public facing, um, a lot of times people don't use registration with Zoom meetings because it seems like kind of cumbersome, but it's a really good idea to do registration even if you're doing it like a Zoom if you're doing like a Zoom webinar, but you're actually using the meeting platform, you can set it up to collect registration. So you can get people's email address and that's going to be really beneficial because then you can follow up with them and send them an evaluation to the program. So again, it, it's going to depend on what your specific objectives are for that program, the type of evaluation that you send them and the type of questions that you are asking in that evaluation. Is the webinar or is the online course are you trying to create awareness? Are you trying to change the behavior? Um, and then kind of craft your questions around those particular objectives. I will say, and I think LOD, correct me if I'm wrong, next week we are focusing our boot camp on assessment and then the following week we're focusing on evaluation, right? And then we're gonna kind of wrap that up with a whole week on reporting. So Debbie and T and a number of other folks are gonna be really diving into like evaluation and reporting like way deeper than what I'm talking about here today. So please stay tuned for the schedule for those boot camps. I think we just released our schedule for next week yesterday, um, and we'll get that up on the website here shortly so you can take a look at um, exactly what we're doing. So, a couple final thoughts here before I hand it over to Debbie to take a look at Vita. Um, don't silo your content. So um, way early on, I think it was one of the first sessions that we did when we started these, these boot camps was on strategic engagement. Don't think that your Facebook page sort of exists over here in this silo, and then your webinars exist over here in this silo, and your online course exists over here in this one. This is really a portfolio of products where you are engaging with people and you're teaching them certain things. Not every single thing that you do has to be formally evaluated, right? Some things you might just be measuring the reach and engagement. Other things you might be doing more formal evaluation with. Um, it is important to kind of keep a strategy in place. It's important to have a good idea of exactly what you're measuring before you just jump into measurement here. <laughs> I see one of my helpers is coming in to help me with our, our presentation here. He just woke up from his nap. <laughs> um, so finally, the thing that I wanted to mention here is it's important to kind of look at an aerial view of that big P program, right? So this is like your portfolio of events and products and then decide what you're going to evaluate and how you're going to evaluate it. Strategize before you just jump in. Thanks, baby. Um, so some other ways that you can start to strategize with content is if you do like launch a video, for example, use things like a call to action 
to make sure that people are flowing through that web of engagement and getting to more deeper learning opportunities where that change in behavior and that change in condition can really start to happen and you can really start to measure it too. So as we look at certain pieces of digital content like a video, make sure that you're showing people exactly what to do now that they've watched the video. Do you want them to, just to subscribe to your YouTube channel? Do you want them to follow your Facebook page? If so, tell them and direct them to where they can do that. Um, if you create a social media post, it might be, hey, register for this program to learn more. It might be like an infographic that you post, but then someplace in that post you say, now register for this program, register for this webinar, take this online course. You wanna be using calls to action in just about every piece of content, even if it's as, if it's as simple as subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on Facebook so that you can learn more. Um, use those calls to action in, in everything that you do, or at least try to if it seems appropriate. And again, depending on what content you're posting, the calls to action might look a little bit different. So that's again, some surface level overview of really some metrics and statistics to think about and some ideas for evaluation for digital content. Um, if you continue to have questions, feel free to email me, put those in the chat in the last um, you know, 15 or so minutes that we have here. But I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Debbie where we can start talking a little bit more about now, now that you have these numbers, what are you gonna do with them? So with that, Debbie, I will let you take over if you're ready. I'm wondering if you all can hear me. I'm joining by phone because my internet connection is so bad. I can, <laughs> can you guys you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, pardon me, I will not start my video because my computer will like freak out on me. All right, so you should be seeing um, my uh, Vita account. Use my Zoom bar. All right, so can everybody see the, the Vita website? Thank you, Danae. I see you're shaking your head. Um, so a lot of the things that Danae has been talking about, um, like the actual object or um, item can be put into the elements side of the Vita platform. So for those of you using Vita, we're at vita.osu.edu. You have to be logged in. You can see over here on the right-hand side that I am logged in. And by the element side, we have this, this um, web menu item called Elements Data. Um, and most of the items that she has been referring to are gonna go under the publication section. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click here because this is gonna open up a new window for me. And you can see my list of publications. So for example, she didn't talk really about a fact sheet, but those things can be uh, digital as well. Uh, so I wanted to show you a few things um, like fact sheets, uh, infographics, websites, that type of thing, where, where you're gonna be tracking all of that. So they all go under publications, even though in our previous system, some of this stuff is uh, what we consider creative works and some of it is actually uh, publications that go out. So under this drop down over here, we're gonna do add a new. Uh, so let's say we're, we wanna add our Facebook page. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, call that multimedia database or website because Facebook is a web page. When I get to this page, I usually skip it because what it's gonna do is just go out and search databases um, for the title of uh, my Facebook page and we don't really want it to do that. So I'm gonna just gonna go ahead and clip click skip for this step. Um, I wanted to show you this here at the top of a page. Only select one of these items. If you select more than one of these items at the top where it says, what's your relationship to this item? Author, translator, editor, contributor. If you select multiple of these, then you are going to end up with um, however many times you check a box up here, you're gonna end up with multiple items. So if I click on author of, editor of, and contributor to, I'm gonna have three different items on my document. So we don't want that. So I'm gonna say, um, this is my Facebook page, so I'm gonna call myself the author of. Um, and then I'm gonna put the title in here, and you would put whatever your Facebook page title is. The type of work, you're gonna say this is a website. 
you're going to have yourself as the author. Um, if your name is not appearing there, which it should since you're logged in, um, you can just search for yourself. Um, if you have co-authors or contributors, you can add other people to um, this, this um, section here. Publication date. Um, we like to track things um, by calendar year. So what I'll probably do is just uh, select uh, January um, 1st to December 31st. So that's just simply opening up those calendars and clicking on a specific date on the calendar. Um, and then you can also put a URL in this field here. I'm going to go ahead and click on save. And then it will be added to this. Um, it's also going to ask me if um, this is associated with any grants that I have in my system. And I'm going to go ahead and so, say, no, this is not externally funded. So I can come back over here to my menu and publications. And it should show that that last one that I just added. So Facebook page tests. Now for each item that you put under the publication section in Vita, you're going to have to go back into the Vita platform, this page here, and you're going to fill out supporting data for each publication that you have listed. So I'm going to click here and say publication. And what I just did was I added a website. So let me just click off of what I had selected here earlier and refilter. Okay, so this is showing the websites that I have. Um, you can see the Facebook page test that I just added. You can also see another title of website test that I added. I'm gonna go ahead and open this one and you can see where I have tracked some of this information. So for each item, you're gonna go in, you're gonna open it up by clicking on the little arrow, you're going to click on edit. And then you could say, um, you could select your authorship type. Um, maybe you're the co-author of this page. Maybe you're the sole author. Um, if you are a co-author, make sure you put in your percent contribution here. And then this is where you can keep track of all of these uh, digital engagement statistics that uh, Danae has been talking about this, this afternoon. And then you're going to go ahead and click on save changes. If you look at your list, and it's you've got like a lot of things in your um, in your list to view. For example, if I come over here and use the filter um, and I select none, you don't see anything over here. But if I select all, there's going to be a lot of items that pop up in this list. So use this feature over here to help you filter through the items that you're looking for so that you're not overwhelmed by the content that's that's here. Um, and then once I open up an item, I can click on view in elements if I see anything that I might want to change in there. Um, and it will take me back to where I just was, where I entered the data for that particular item. So back under here, over, under publications, the other things you might do um, are fact sheet and you could do fact sheet downloads and you would track that information the same place that I just showed you in the supporting data information in the, in the Vita section. Um, websites would be on here. This is also where you're going to put, um, for example, the e-newsletters that Danae was um, talking about. Um, those would go under other creative works. So newsletters would go under other creative works. Um, I think I have an example in here, so I'm just going to show you the example. Um, some of the other items, um, the video views, for example, um, if you have uh, posted a YouTube video or had that uh, YouTube video posted on the OSU Extension Professionals website, then you can add that as a online broadcast recording. So I'm going to go ahead and open this one because this one actually was added under media. So one of the items over here in this drop down is to add new media. And this is going to be anything like a radio broadcast, a television um, broadcast, or uh, a YouTube video. So if I click on this item and I open it and click on edit record, I can open it. 
I'm going to have the title on there. Um, this is going to be an on online broadcast recording. Um, this, I would put the actual date that it was broadcast on. And then I put in here the medium. It was a YouTube video. And this will show up in, in my actual uh, entry for this. When I come over here, I'm going to show you um, that I already have um, my extension annual report open. So you can see how these um, look on a document. So I have generated an extension annual report. So those fact sheets and um, the uh, YouTube video, they're going to appear in this first section called scholarly work. Uh, so your bulletin technical reports and fact sheets have their own section. And um, you can see here uh, that before I discovered the glitch in the system, this, this item um, was posted three different times because I probably put co-author, I put contributor to, um, et cetera. So you'll see that little glitch there. Um, so only click one of those items as you're adding new items into the system, only click one of those boxes. Um, down here, you'll see the, the other things appear in what we call creative works. I hope I'm not making you too dizzy. Um, so section I uh, is our multimedia database and websites. And I have not refreshed this since I added that Facebook test, but this is where that, that this is the section that would appear in. Uh, plus, this is a 2019 report, and I just added that as a 2020 item. So it wouldn't appear on this document anyway. Um, here's my radio and television. This is um, just the section. This is, you know, old time report. We're talking about uh, the Office of Academic Affairs who came up with these uh, headers for the document a while ago. Um, but this is where our uh, YouTube video is going to land. So you can see here that um, what I typed in that medium field um, is a YouTube video. And then what I could add again to that supporting data back in Vita for these items is any of the, uh, the digital engagement statistics that you can get off of the various types of items. Now, the second thing that uh, Janae was talking about, does anybody have any questions about those? Um, did not open my chat box back up. But I'm sure somebody will tell me if there's any questions. OK, so I'm going to move on. The uh, more formal engagement um, types of uh, things that you're going to be tracking that Danae talked about last, we're going to put those items into our extension module in the VITA system. So if you hover over the word department and you open up your extension module, we're going to put those items into what she was referring to as the large P program. So I'm just going to open one of these up. And again, my internet connection is very slow, so I apologize. Okay, so for some of the um, qualitative comments that she was referring to there at the end, we're gonna be able to put that information into, um, for example, the impact, the short-term outcome, the medium-term outcome, and the long-term outcome statements. So again, uh, the short-term is those changes in awareness, um, medium-term change in behavior, and change in condition for the final. So if you get any of those anecdotal stories um, from your participants, this is a good place for you to talk about that. So it, make it made a difference for this person and this is how. Um, so this is where you're gonna wanna track that impact information. If you wanna put some more information about um, activities or products, um, this could be uh, some of those dig digital engagement statistics again, um, or you know the fact that you created um, however many YouTube videos or posts. Um, but here you would be talking more about just kind of like numbers and what was done during the year. Um, down here is where you're going to be talking about the impact of those items. And then for each program, large P program, um, she talked about the smaller P program. So we have events that um, kind of support our larger P programs. This is where you're going to be putting your direct contact information. So this is one of my examples here. So you can put um, the information in here for direct contacts. Um, make sure you put a webinar in um, this section here. 
And if you were um, doing a webinar and you were actually teaching something, um, and you weren't just the person organizing it, but you actually taught some content, make sure you click on yes, you did teach. And I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. This is where you can also put some of those indirect contact numbers that we're talking about. So how many email contacts, uh, media appearances, materials distributed, that type of thing. Um, and this, this is where you're gonna keep just the numbers. So this, an event is where you're gonna keep that quantitative information about each of your, your events and your, your programs that are, your events that are supporting those large P programs. So this is the quantitative information and then the extension program um, is where you're gonna keep that more qualitative information. And when you're looking in VITA, you can tell that this is a program because it's, um, it's uh, not indented and then all of the events is, uh, that are supporting this program are indented underneath it. So I think that's about all. Danae, did I miss anything of what you wanted me to talk about today? I don't think so. I think that about covered it. Thank you so much. It was kind of a whirlwind fast um, share, but um, as Denise mentioned in a couple of weeks, the last week of May is when we're going to have a little bit more in-depth uh, time to spend on VITA. We've got a couple of days I'm going to spend time in element side and then also the extension module side. Yeah. Yep. And for anybody reporting in VITA, that would be a really, really good week to attend. Um, I know a lot of people tend to have questions and they tend to keep them until like what the first or second week of January, like the week that reports are due. Um, it's a good Something idea like to, to try and like keep up to date with reporting <laughs> like month by month. Um, as a former educator, um, I always put my programs in immediately following the program. <laughs> I did not. I don't know. You sound a little <laughs> bit sarcastic there today. It's so hard to <laughs> do. <a> tad. <laughs> but every year I would tell myself yeah, you, that I was going to do it. <laughs> Yeah, you've got to improve those habits um, and then it becomes an easier, easier job. Yes, yes. So with that, that is our wrap up of this week's boot camp. And we hope to see you back for next week's all about assessment, community needs assessment. Um, does anybody have that schedule on hand that we could just share real fast? Has it been posted to the LOD website yet? Does anybody know? Um, I have it. I have it up, uh, Danae. I can share it real quick. That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much, Dee. So on Monday, we're going to be talking. Brian and Amy are going to be talking about getting started with community needs assessment. On Tuesday, Debbie and I are going to be talking about ways that we listen to our community, whether that's through focus groups or listening sessions. And then on Wednesday, Amy and I will be talking about, well, so what do we do with all that data now that we have it, all those words? Um, we're going to try to make you a word nerd on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, uh, Amy's going to introduce the asset, assets-based approach to uh, communities and also access-based, some great work that she's done in that regard. And then on Friday, Becky Nesbitt from the Community Development team is going to be talking, is going to be joining us to talk about uh, examples of how we do this work in community. So it's going to be a great week. We're really excited about the next couple of weeks. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you so much for attending this week. Another great week with great numbers.